Greetings to everyone as you come in. We're just waiting for a few more people to join us. Well, good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, I'm sure more people will be joining us as we proceed, but we need to move things along at this point. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you all here this evening for this webinar. My name's Ed Iser, and I am a professor of theater and the associate dean for the performing arts at the college. And it's my pleasure to serve as the master of ceremonies this evening. The turnout for the event has been wonderful. We're already up to a couple hundred and expecting a lot more and we're delighted that so many alumni, parents, students, and friends could join us for this webinar discussion with David Saint and Bart Schur, led by Professor Steve Weinberg. Um, I'd like to take this moment to give a special thanks and a shout out to the Holy Cross Alumni Association for putting this event together, and especially to Kristen Dyer for her tireless efforts. So today was a big day, a very big day for the United States of America and a big day for all of us as we celebrate the inauguration of a new president and begin the process of national reconciliation and healing. It is appropriate that we're hosting two major artists this evening who will invariably play a significant role in the process of renewal that awaits us. And we all eagerly long for this renewal, this renewal, this renaissance that will occur with the distribution of the vaccine. And when this happens, we will once again be able to come together as a community. We'll be able to come together to pray, to break bread, to celebrate weddings, to mourn at funerals, to cheer at sporting events, and yes, to celebrate our collective humanity in the creation and experience of art. And Holy Cross will be ready and well prepared to play a major role in this cultural renewal with the launching of the prior center for the performing arts. The college has embraced the centrality of the arts as a critical component in a liberal Jesuit education. The center will enrich academic offerings across the curriculum. It will provide a communal place for reflection and discernment. It will leverage inventiveness in all fields and provide opportunities for interdisciplinary interaction and exploration. But most important, the center will attract a new and diverse cadre of performing art students who will enrich and re-energize the college as only art students can do. And finally, quite simply, it's a beautiful facility that will draw regional and national interest. So we invite you all to follow the progress on the construction of the new art center to track the process of renewal by accessing the 24 hour camera overlooking the site just Google Holy Cross webcams 
And of course, we will be eager to welcome you in person in the fall of 2022 when the new Arts Center opens. Tonight's discussion is to be led by my colleague, Professor Steve Weinberg from the Department of Theater and Dance. Steve is a distinguished professor of art and humanities who has published three books, two on film studies and an award-winning book on method acting. He is a longtime contributor to the distinguished journal Three Penny Review, and over the years has published hundreds of reviews and features in a host of outlets. At Holy Cross, Steve teaches courses in dramatic literature, theater history, and film studies. A scholarly artist, he has directed 20 productions and acted in half a dozen others. Ladies and gentlemen, my colleague, Professor Steve Weinberg. Thank you, Ed. Bart and David, please join us. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, David and Bart. Uh, we're extraordinarily lucky to have two remarkably distinguished directors who both happen to be Holy Cross alums. Uh, David Saint graduated from Holy Cross in 1975 and initially worked as an actor studying with the distinguished legendary, actually, acting teacher Uta Hagen at the Herbert Berghoff Studio in New York. And for more than two decades, he has served as the artistic director of the George Street Playhouse in New Brunswick, New Jersey, where he's directed 40 main stage productions, as well as productions in many other venues. His time at George Street has included a remarkable partnership with the late playwright Arthur Lawrence, 11 of whose plays he's directed, including several productions of West Side Story like a two-night concert performance of the Hollywood Bowl and an inventive environmental production in Tokyo. Uh, David is an associate producer of Steven Spielberg's upcoming movie of West Side Story. And he's also president of the Lawrence Hatcher Foundation, which funds new plays and musicals. He's received the Alan Schneider Award, the Helen Hayes Award, the LA Drama Critics Circle Award, and several Drama Logue Awards. Bartlett Scher graduated from Holy Cross in 1981. He served as company director for, for the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, associate artistic director at Hartford Stage, and then as artistic director of the Intamin Theater in Seattle before becoming resident director at Lincoln Center Theater. He's directed opera at the Met, the English National Opera, and the Seattle Opera and also in Salzburg and Milan, among other venues. And an impressive number of plays and musicals, many of them at Lincoln Center or under the auspices of Lincoln Center Theater. They include The Light in the Piazza, South Pacific, for which he won a Tony Award, Women on the Verge of a Nervous Breakdown, The King and I, Fiddler on the Roof, My Fair Lady, the recent Aaron Sorkin adaptation of To Kill a Mockingbird, Golden Boy, and Oslo, of which he's just directed the HBO film version. Uh, I wanted to thank everyone who sent in questions. Some of them were excellent, and uh, many of them were excellent. And I'll try to incorporate some of them if we have time. Tonight, we're gonna focus on the theatrical process. So I won't be asking you, uh, Bart and David, about the ways in which your Holy Cross educated education contributed to your careers, or um, what you think about the challenges of returning to live theater after the pandemic. But for those who asked what our two guests have been up to since the theaters went dark, I can report that Bart has been working on the film of Oslo and that David has been busier than ever running the Lawrence Hatcher Foundation. Uh, which is a more crucial enterprise than ever these days. What I was hoping to do tonight was to ask you both to take us through something that most of our audience won't know anything about, the process of directing a professional show. So, to begin, David and Bart, you're both way past the stage in your careers 
when you are directors for hire. So I wanted to start by asking you, what are the considerations in both new plays and revivals that make you want to direct something? Uh, well, I'll, I'll jump in if uh, that's all right. Um, I think for me, it's always about the fact that uh, I direct a lot of new plays and if the script grabs me and, and speaks to me emotionally and intellectually, I have to be really taken by the script as an audience member first, just reading it. And uh, if that's not the case, then I'm not interested in directing it. If, if I'm not passionate about the material, I think it starts and ends with your passion. And that's how you best serve the playwright and the production. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think uh, I, I agree with that. Obviously there's, uh, I would probably add to that, that more often than not, um, they come as assignments. You know, uh, if Peter Gelb calls you from the Met and says, would you do Barber of Seville? You, you may not know Barber of Seville, but you're probably not gonna say no. Um, just because you really would like to do that kind of gig and it sounds fun and it sounds interesting. Um, so half the time uh, I'm doing classical work or interpretive, what I would call interpretive work where it's based on some, something like out of Shakespeare, an opera, a classic text, and then the other half might be developing new things. And the impulses for either are quite different. So uh, I kind of end up in a very, um, the, the worry with something new is just, uh, as, as David said, does it grab you? Do you feel connect? Do you feel something personally connected to it? Does it have some immediate significance either in the world or for you personally? And then the other is, do you hope it's gonna be good? <laughs> so that's just simply. <laughs> enough yeah once once you're set to direct the play how do you approach the script what's your process for preparing the stage go ahead david <laughs> That's all uh, all right. yeah. well um i think you know once again what i first do once i decide i'm i'm going to direct a certain uh play i just read the play many times, uh, primarily, first and foremost, as an audience member. Uh, and then, uh, then I, depending on the material, I will start to envision it uh, physically, uh, visually, or how I'm a, a way into that world. Uh, and then also casting, you know, casting the designers, casting the actors, you know, who, uh, who might be right for these parts. And then sometimes when I read a script, I'm sure b both Art and I at this point in our careers, especially if actors are over say 25 or 30, we, we tend to know so many actors now because you know you work in this business a while, you get to know an awful lot of them. You've either worked with them or you know their work so well. So uh, you know, I start to envision actors in the play and then I read it again with them in mind and then it takes on a, a different life. Um, and then first and foremost, usually, uh, at least for me, the, the first people I meet with are other than the producers, if it's I'm doing it somewhere other than George Street Playhouse, um, if I'm working for other producers, I meet with them and talk about things. But basically, I usually start with the designers and, and typically uh, a set designer because you need to create the world and also just with the practicality of it. Um, you need to get a jump on in time wise on the, the physical world of the piece uh, long before you with casting, you can cast someone months ahead of time, but oftentimes, you know, they have movies that, or they'll drop out or so mm -hmm. the acting, the actors don't usually get cast into a production in my experience uh, until after the designers are on board. So I get started with the designers creating the world and then I move on to casting. I don't know if that's the way you More have questions it too about far, but... working with designers in a minute. Yeah. yeah. Um, I find that the, the, the preparation process is different for different things. So, um, and really important. So uh, there's like how you come to an interpretation. If you're gonna be looking at a Shakespeare, you're gonna like 
often what I've done is spend a lot, just not, not only a lot of time with the text, but I'll investigate the history of the text, like how people have approached it in the past, how they might've looked at it. If I'm doing an opera, I have a very involved way of doing an opera. A friend of mine takes me through every note because I don't read music and I have to write, bef this is before I get to an interpretation and I do a lot of work on it. And then once I've gone through and really learned what I think the score is doing or where it is, and I have an understanding of where it sits in the kind of world of its previous interpretations, then I'll start in the course of that to develop ideas about what I might want to do. And once those sort of deeper impulses are engaged, then as, as, as David said, I will move to my designers first to begin to build whatever the world is that's gonna reveal the piece. Um, often I treat them a little bit like site-specific art installations. So I'm gonna to wanna to know what the space is it's gonna be in, like which kind of place I'm gonna be. So I may do, be developing it in terms of that. I'll be very aware if it has political overtones within the within the time I'm in, whether that's gonna affect how I'm interpreting it. And I may be having personal sort of responses to it. Um, and it may mean that I also, if it's something that's been done a lot, I'm like maybe looking for ways to turn it on its head or pull it apart or, you know, or mash it together. If it's something new, like if you take something like uh, Mockingbird, you know, that's a development process. So that's, or Oslo, that's four or five workshops where you keep building it and building it and building it. Then it might be longer workshops. And then you start the process of casting uh, and, and design, which will lead to a production. Only once you're sure you have something that's been developed long enough to be ready to go on. If it's a musical like Light in the Piazza, you might get a couple of swings at it. So you do it first in Chicago before you bring it into New York. And, and in the old days with musicals, they would do them all over a, in a couple of cities in the country as they were bringing them into the city to make sure they were ready. So there's, there's a lot of pathways depending on the material. You actually also answered my question, though, David, you may want to elaborate on this because you've directed so many new plays. Um, I was going to ask something about the what it was like to develop a new work for the stage. Uh, do you go at it the way Mark just indicated? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it, one of the things, uh, obviously, if you have a classic ahead of time, um, in the world that you want to research is already set. With a new play, it may be developing. I mean, uh, years yeah. ago, I, I did a new play with uh, Peter Parnell uh, the, about uh, Flaubert, and the two of us went to France and went to every little town and village that Flaubert had lived or written in. Um, uh, uh, for, you know, we were over there for three or four weeks um, researching as he was writing the play because we wanted to both become more entrenched in that world. I mean, that's a luxury. And if, you, if you're able to do that, that's wonderful. Um, I, I think in terms of the process, it's as different as every writer and every writer is so different. You know, Arthur Lawrence um, loved to rewrite. He loved rewriting. And he always said, no play cannot be improved by cutting. He was a great believer in cutting. Uh, he liked to write it all out there, but then he liked to cut and he liked to rewrite. Someone like uh, A.R. Gurney, uh, with whom I did many new plays, he would change, he would torture himself over changing an and to a but, you know? <laughs> he didn't really rewrite that much. He would cut sometimes, but not a lot of rewrites. Every playwright is different. So you have to treat them each differently. Yeah, and, and, and um, you know, you learn if you've done Shakespeare, you've done classics, which you can't change. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know, and, and a lot of Shakespeare's plays are big and ungainly and not perfect. You find, oh, I've, you get to scenes where you're like, what the hell? Why didn't they work <laughs> this out in the workshop process <laughs> 100 years ago? But it's a good exercise because it forces you to uh, engage the interpretive muscle to a point where you keep looking for solutions to things which otherwise don't really make sense to you. So there's a kind of muscle that goes into pure interpreting. Operas sometimes just don't add up. So you come up with lots of things to kind of make sense of them. If you're doing Tales of Hoffman, it's this ungainly three-story structure, which you have to develop an envelope to hold. When you're doing something new, you have the opposite problem. Everything can change whenever you want it to, in whatever way you want it to. And you have to be judging your writers, you say they are all different, about how 
to wait if something doesn't make sense before saying, oh, we can fix your second act by doing this and this and this, because it may be there's something weird and strange in it, in it that you shouldn't change. But so the questions get more complicated with new work because you're, you're steering through a very- um, Uncharted limitless, territory. Yeah, yeah, limitless possibilities. And, and structure can have a huge impact and it can take a lot of time to sort of unveil what that could be. So it's, it's a fascinating process, but you're always trapped between the interpretive impulse and the creative impulse. And you're pulling between these two poles as you're unpacking this work that's in front of you. And every work is autonomous. It has its own logic, whether it's new or interpreted. And so you're building this logic in front of you as you go along. And you have to have both be open and skilled as you shape it. And there are as many ways of directing as there are directors as well, you know, and I don't know if it's because Bard and I both went to Holy Cross, I don't think, but could be uh, that I think both of us have a great deal of respect for the text. Um, there are many directors out there working today who will do a classic and they will change it, even though, you know, that's, you know, Bar I, what I admire about Bart's uh, productions, and I've seen so many of them, the uh, revivals of these classics, um, you know, he might bring his instinct to it and his vision, but he always keeps the text, the text. And I have great respect for that because a lot of directors won't, they'll just throw things out. You know, I mean, I recently uh, give you an example of production that was done over in Europe of uh, West Side Story. And uh, as the executor of the estate, I had to step in because they had uh, uh, Maria kill herself at the end of the, at the end of the uh, play, oh, which, which, <laughs> is is you know that's completely rewriting the text um and uh so you know uh, there are but there are directors who think that their vision comes first not the writers and i always believe that the play is the thing and the the, the written version comes first and we're so interpreters there, there may be things inside of something that's already written which you can unpack that we see differently now than they would have been seen at the time so in the case of south pacific the ideas of race and the ideas that, you know, carefully taught that Hammerstein in the late forties was beginning to explore. We now know having looked back 60 years later that there were even more issues of race that were deeper that were bubbling under it. And you could find ways of pulling that up even more profoundly as we could see it now. That could also be true of Merchant of Venice, which is, you know, some people would call anti-Semitic, some people would call it something else, but it's still sitting on top of all these questions, which he may or may not be grappling with in his own way, you know, in the 16th century. But now we look at it completely differently and they offer this sort of active exploration of, quest, you know, questions of what it means to be human in each era they get asked. And that that's where I'm very lucky as a Holy Cross grad to apply my liberal arts sensibility to the questions of asking these things all the time through the texts, th through the age in which they're written and applying to them to now and asking what they're there for, because that's the active experience of people going back to see something or going back to, or going, why the hell on earth is somebody gonna spend $150 to go see Hamlet if you don't have to, right? Only, but mostly because Hamlet, ask really interesting questions in the 16th century, which now when we ask those questions, we see them totally differently. And so I'm put, putting my shoulder to this kind of wheel of time as I'm making sense of what it is for me now. And that can be an interesting journey. Also for me, you know, I started as an actor and, you know, I studied with Uta Hagen for six years and she had a great impact on me. And, you know, uh, when you say, why would you see Hamlet again? Um, for me, it's often who's playing Hamlet and what they bring to it, because uh, a really superb actor can change a piece completely based on their interpretation uh, of their artistry as an actor. Um, oh, that's fascinating. I want to ask you something more about design, which you introduced um, a few minutes ago, David. Um, what are the best elements of a design for you as directors? Uh, perhaps you might um, share with us a couple of specific experiences that you've had with designers that you remember with particular fondness. Um, 
I think early on, uh, and it was at Seattle, and I, Bart, Bart and I both spent time in Seattle. I was at Seattle Rep, and he was next door at the Intamon. Um, and uh, uh, I worked with a set designer there, an older man named Alexander Oken, who was Russian. Uh, and he had been the de resident designer at the Moscow Art Theater for years. Uh, his father and grandfather before him were were also designers and direct and designed the actual original productions of Chekhov at the uh, Moscow Arts Theater. So his stories were extraordinary. But the thing that he pushed me more than any other designer ever had was up to that point, you know, I would talk about an environment that I wanted for a design or the, the emotional feeling I wanted from a design. I mean, I'm a great art lover, so I have a lot of paintings and, and I'm a big, uh, a big lover of art. And so I talked about different artists, paintings, things that the feel, the feelings that were evoked that, and he was the first one who said to me, I don't want to hear any of that. All I want to hear from you is, he would say, David, everyone who goes to see a play, can Harvard professor can sit next to a sanitation worker. They hear the play differently up here, but if it's a good play, they both have the same <laughs> moment where they <laughs> emotionally respond to the material. And he said, I cannot start to design the play until you tell me what is the moment, what this play is about for you. And you know, at the time we were doing a play called Six Degrees of Separation by John Guare. And I, I was, you know, I said, well, it's about, he said, what's it about? I said, it's about this and this and this many different intellectual interpretations. And he said, mm, mm, no, no, what is the moment it's about? And he made, he forced me to economize my thinking emotionally. And I realized what the climactic moment of the play for me was. And it was when we saw the female lead turns to her husband and says, we're a terrible match. And so then he said, ah, now I can design it. And he took the whole design from that emotional climax that I brought to it. And as he said, another director would give him a different climax and he would design it differently. So that was a great help for me. And I've tried to use that with other designers uh, as I've used, yeah, I think you asked me if George Reed has resident designers, we don't. I, we just, there's a lot of designers that I've worked with a lot because you develop a vocabulary. Yeah, I, I've worked with many of the same designers uh, in the same way. So. Um, uh, you know, designing for stage space uh, is is very different than other things. So, um, I, I I think it I, again I think it takes it takes a long time to develop a good mise en scène, and there you are looking for moments. You're looking for certain things, but you're also looking for kind of a machine that's going to operate the play. So you're you spend a certain amount of time with just floor plans and like knowing this is coming from there and there and there and there and there. And there's a kind of complex mechanism that's gonna operate this thing. So often writers now will write new plays with 78 scenes and they'll be in 55 locations. And so you end up having to build some sort of machine. <laughs> and they say it's always, yeah. and always in the beginning, Bartha. I love it when they always say, all of this is accomplished through lighting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so you end up having to build something which approximates some something in the piece and the other thing about um, good design is it is capable in the expansion and contraction of space of, of operating metaphorically within the viewer. So you're often building something which is beginning as it's being perceived is also internally being kind of taken in. And you can shape moments in ways through all of the means at your disposal, music, light, set, et cetera, the kind of ways in which you're experiencing it. It can be highly manipulative in that way, but you're building into how these things operate. And if you like exploring metaphor, you like exploring, you know, sort of more abstract notions of space, you're also often hunting for ways in which the rules you set up in the beginning start to come apart or shift or change with that aha moment that David's describing. So having uh, something that's malleable enough and workable enough to, to operate within the, that's resonating within the ideas of the language or structure of the play is, is interesting. Shakespeare again is another good teacher of this because he didn't change the sets. You know, they had a space in the globe 
that operated based on language. You could move from the inner above to the inner below, you could change the space and it could move very quickly from one to the other. That's interesting how the writing is to a certain space. And so Shakespeare's plays are based on the space he knows he's writing for. They're not just you know written for no reason that way. Uh, for any reason that way. And that's not also true. That's not often true. That will also be true for Chekhov, who will do four sets and then you'll be in each set. But in new plays, it's going to be like they're writing film scripts that you have to find a way to get from, you know, the airport, you know, to to the girlfriend's house and back to mom's and then over to wherever where the world all turns pink and then turns blue. And then you're like, OK, that'll be great. And you're trying to figure those things out. And that is a different kind of mechanism. So that and doesn't it, really answer your question, but there's, it becomes central mechanism to how it operates. And also Bart, you mentioned a word that I love, which is metaphor. And my whole life, I believe that theater is the art of metaphor. And, you know, I've had this um, conversation uh, often with Arthur Lawrence, but also with Andre Bishop, who was one of my great um, mentors too, and I know is is yours too, Bart. And you know, I remember giving him a play sometimes, and Andre would say, "Well, it's very well written, but it's I think it's more of a TV show or a movie." <laughs> and I'd say, "Well, why do you say?" He said, "There's no play beneath the play. There's no metaphor, and I think the best plays are metaphors, um, and that's why designers designing for theater, as Bart said, is a completely different." art skill, art form, you know, d doing a movie. I mean, even, you know, I had many, many long conversations with uh, Tony Kushner and Spielberg on this movie of Westside. And, you know, you put a, a fire escape and a shaft of light in an empty space and it can become New York City. Once you turn it into a movie and you have the entire realistic, literal New York City, then what do you do with uh, you know, gang members coming out of the alley and suddenly bursting into dance. You know, as Arthur would say, then they become a, a, a gang of ballerinas. You know, it's sort of like, it doesn't, the realities don't mesh. So you have to find a way to make it work. Whereas in theater, I think you have the gift of metaphor and we're willing to suspend our disbelief far more quickly. You know, I mean, it's like in your production oh, sorry. part, Bart, that production you did of uh, the Clifford Odets play, where all of a sudden the walls started to fly away. You yeah. know, that, Awake and Sing. Yeah, Awake yeah. and Sing. That was, that was an emotional moment. It's like what I talk about uh, Alexander Oaken saying, uh, everyone in the audience responded the same way. You can't do that in a movie no, the you, same way. You just no. can't, you know? No, but to, and that's, I appreciate your saying that. It, uh, but the time, how I came, how, how you come upon those moments where yes. the operation of the set is resonating with some subtextual reality in the piece and beginning to shift in the metaphor. A lot of that came for me through working on this Polish avant-garde uh, man named Tadeusz Kantor, who, who had great mm -hmm. ways of mm -hmm. expanding and contracting metaphor and space and cracking and breaking rules. So if you set up a set of your own rules, you start to break them as you get to the second half of the piece, then you uncover what might be underneath them. And what the relationship between the subtext and the, the, the text above it is, is very interesting. That is the horrible, boring part about movies is that it often is an extremely literal art. Yes. So getting, uh, you know, the Fellini out of uh, an episode yeah. of, I don't know, um, uh, Law and Order is, you know, they're very far apart in terms of how they express reality. And that's interesting. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about uh, working with actors. Um, some directors are famously hands-on with actors. And by contrast, the filmmaker Robert Altman used to say that he had absolutely no idea how actors did the amazing things they did. And it would be presumptuous of him to tell them how. So he, he left it to their own resources to develop their characters. Um, uh, I'm, I don't believe that, by the way. I think that's something he said in an interview. I don't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I don't buy it for a second. Maybe, maybe, maybe he just let them do whatever they wanted. But halfway through the movie, 
I'm sure if it wasn't very good, he still had to do something. No, I directed Keith Carradine in a play and his stories about Robert Altman in Nashville were anything but that, anything yes. but that. Yeah. Anyway, sorry. Keep going. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's fascinating. I'm so, writing a book about be, Robert Altman. Be, I should be, be taking careful. notes. Here. Be careful what you read. Be yeah. careful what you read. Uh, and mm. interviews. It sounds them. like a good pose. Oh, I don't do anything. I just, right. I just let them do what they want <laughs> and follow it. Work. They're so brilliant, all of them. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't buy it. Sorry. Uh, I don't buy it either. <laughs> well, uh, sorry. How but, would you talk about the way you work with actors? Well, I started as an actor, so I definitely, people say, you know, there are directors who are actors, directors, and, you know, I probably put myself in that category only because I was able to work as an actor with some extraordinary actors, and I had such, uh, uh, such respect and, and really in awe of them that when I got to direct them then, and when I became a director, um, I realized that, um, for me, it's sort of, uh, it's that thing of teaching a child how to ride a bike. You know, you want, the child wants to say, dad, you know, be there in case I fall, but leave me alone. Let go of me, let me do it on my own. So it's that sense of, I think most actors are, who are really good want the freedom to find it, but they want the roadmap. Um, you know, some I, 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 one actor I worked with early on, Elizabeth Wilson, whom I adored, said to me, um, early on in the process, we need to hear from you the way in to the play. Like, what is this play to us as we interpret these roles? And because that gives them a way in. So I think they do need guidance. They also, I found at the beginning when I first started directing, I did so much research and I had so many, you know, opinions and, and about every scene. And then I, I realized a lot of it was learning when to shut up and get them to where you want them to be, but let them find it themselves and just slowly guide them um, like a child riding a bike, you know? Um, and it doesn't matter how old or how experienced they are. Uh, you know, I directed Paul Newman in a play and I thought, you know, uh, I was so intimidated at first. And then I found almost more than most I'd worked with, um, he wanted daddy to be there, even though I was much younger and I was a director and he wanted daddy to help him find the way. Others, leave me alone. Leave, Elaine May, you know, she, she is, has her own crazed mind and she doesn't want you hovering over her until she goes to you and asks. So again, it's, it completely depends on the actor. That's yeah, been my I, I think I, I think I would say it somewhat similarly. I think you're building a conversation and, and the more specific you are in the conversation, and the more trust you build in the conversation, we're, we're both lucky enough to work with people who have their own process, yes. generally, who have their own way of going about things. And they're all going to be a little bit different. But if you, if, you, if you have a good conversation going with them, you have to be patient enough to let them go through their discovery of it, offer them enough information about the world they're in, build. Uh, the hardest thing about good acting is ensemble building, like how to get everyone else in the same play as that maybe that great performance that they're all sharing the same conversation and then that the more sophisticated that conversation gets then the further you get when you get in the middle of previews you're able to like pull the levers more elegantly and sh and carefully to make adjustments within whatever you've built a, a conversation about and if it's going well that's all going to happen uh effectively film is different because film you go from you know first reading to you know, rehearsal to previews to opening in about 90 minutes because you have to go so quickly. And that is a much more uh, intense and kind of scarier environment for, for figuring out how to get something. You'll use the course of the shooting of the scene to kind of crack open the scene and hope you have enough versions of it that you can build it later. But in theater, you have this long process which you want to build enough trust and connection with the act. And you need to know what they do. You need to know what an action is. You need to know how to uh, suit movement to an event. You need to create a mise-en-scene which will open up and resonate with whatever's the internal life of the character. You need to build connections with everybody, transactional ex events, experiences. You have a lot to accomplish. But And you do need to know what their process is and what their what's how to speak to them in a way which is useful to them. And, and each one them. may be spoken to differently. 
yeah. you know, you've got it when you have a, I'm sure about you, have you've dealt with this where you have a big cast and, and you have an actor who's classically trained uh, and then another actor who's brand new, all full of emotion, but no technique. And you've got another person who's a real method actor. And yeah. how do you meld them so that they all feel like they're in the same world? And that's, that means you have to speak to each one differently. Yeah, and you, you can't be afraid of conflict because a good actor who's, who, who is gonna push you and disagree with you and get into a dialectic with you that's very intense and over, it could be over a lot of questions as they're heading toward where they're getting and you can't shrink back from the conflict. Right, right. Well, because they'll smell fear too and yeah. they smell weakness. And that's the thing is that I truly believe whether you call it a parent, the head of the household, or a captain of the ship, each play or musical needs the head, needs the, the leader to lead the way. And it, it, particularly, as Bart is saying, if you, and we've dealt, I'm sure we, we, I know we both have, dealt with very successful actors who may feel like they know the best way, but you have to be careful. They can't lead the play. I mean, it was fascinating watching Arthur Lawrence. I was his uh, co-associate uh, director on Gypsy and watching Patti Lapone and Arthur because, you know, it was like they went at each other and Patti was um, testing him and he would not let her win. And ultimately, um, it, 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 it turned out beautifully, you know, and she gave a fantastic performance, but it was quite a dance to get there. She did give a fantastic performance. Yeah, I agree. Um, how do you know when a performance is working? What does that mean, working? If for you personally, for the play, for the audience, for the, what? For the play, I guess. I'm. I'm not so much thinking about, you know, what the audience is thinking, but what you're thinking in a, in a rehearsal, for example, or, or in a performance. Uh, I'm. I'm not. Um... I think the, 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 the difficulty of what you're saying um, or what you're asking is that you're putting it in a good or bad uh, sort of yes. philosophical a, ju a judgmental, yeah. And, a judgment. and, and if, if it's evolving, you have to not, you can get very, you know, you can be around people who are like, oh, this guy's terrible, that's blah, blah, blah. And they're very judgmental and quickly assessing, but it's probably not healthy for a good process to be like that. You're. You, you know, something might not be very good for a long time and then suddenly be good. Something might be, you might not really understand it. You may, you may end up restaging all the way around the way something's going differently and discover something you didn't expect in it. Yes, so, I, I mean, that not that thrilling though? When you suddenly you realize, oh, I was wrong about this because uh, uh, an actor has brought something to light that you didn't think of. And suddenly you might change your mind and say, you know, so, but when you say something's working, it's like when people say, what's the most successful things you, you know, success is such a, uh, a subjective term, <laughs> because what does that mean? You know, what, what runs the longest, what, what's the most, makes the most money, gets the best reviews, you know, I mean, uh, success is very a hard thing to talk about with art, I think, I think. Yeah, yeah, you want to stay the away. Correction, I actually wasn't talking about success, but. No, 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 no. But you were talking about when it's working. That's right. why I asked, that. what does that mean when yeah. it's working? Um, you actually brought something up that makes me think of another question, David. Um, you, uh, I know Bart has had this uh, experience um, with some of the longer running shows, Bart, you've done, um, where... Um, where leading performers get changed. Um, you know, for example, Lauren Ambrose um, played Eliza in My Fair Lady, and then Laura Benanti took over the role. Um, as I recall, I ran into you the day that I came to see the performance. Um, they were both terrific, I thought, but very, very different. Um, so what, um, what is that process like of, for you of, guiding a, a, a different performer through um i mean it's connected to what we were saying earlier uh, it was very clear i mean i love doing 
building the first production with Lauren, who's an extraordinary actor. We did Wake and Sing together. She's incredible. But, and I worked with Laura before too. We did Women on the Verge. Um, but they are absolute opposites. And so the issue there is not, here is my interpretation, fill it. The issue is here is this great work. It can go in these different directions. And you have to shape the performance to what Laura Benanti, who brings a whole different series of things to it than Lauren Ambrose, and allow those to breathe within their own context. I mean, on, on tour now, we have a woman named Shereen Ahmed, who's incredible and different to either of those two. So you have to allow that to be the case, uh, that there is an interpretive, artistic uh, thing that each artist, an artist as great as Benanti or an artist as strong as Lauren will bring to something, but they don't have to be the same. And putting one into the other's performance in the same way, if you work in opera with Anna Netrebko, you know, she's a hell of a lot different than any other soprano. And, you know, who knows what it's going to be. They just have to be allowed to breathe in their own space. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know about you, Bart, but it took me a little while to learn that because at the, at the beginning it was like, no, 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 you can understand that those laughs are there for a reason. And this is your, you're losing that laugh. And, you know, it's like, so when I have B. Arthur replace Ann Mira, in a play, they're completely different creatures. They're both brilliant and brilliant comic actresses. But I had to let go of Anne's laughs and real, let B find her own, you know? And she, she uh, amazingly, I was so surprised, she, B never wanted to go for a laugh, ever. You know, um, she was much closer to a method actress than you would think. But also it's like something Arthur always talked about with Gypsy. Each production of Gypsy, you have to start with your rose. And it's all about the rose. And I mean, I was lucky enough to see Angela Lansbury and Tyne Daly and uh, Bernadette Peters and Betty Buckley and Patti LuPone and Imelda Staunton. Each one of them brought who they are as an artist and as a person, their, their assets. And I found, I remember when Bernadette was doing it, I think she was having great trouble uh, in, and, uh, in, the, in rehearsals and all because she wasn't being allowed by the director to bring any of who she is to the piece. So her, I mean, you think of Bernadette Peters, you think, you know, her, her sexuality and her, you know, uh, adorable cuteness and her powers of seducing, none of that was there. And so it wasn't until she was free to, to, to bring some of who she was that the, the part started to work again. You know. Um, how do you um, how do you think about the way you use a, the space? How how conceptual would you say your approaches are to using the space? Well, I, I mean, Bart mentioned this earlier. You can't design it until you know the space. You know, because the space does dictate. I mean, you know, if you've seen, which I'm sure you have, you know. I mean, uh, I don't know if I'm, you know, uh, ruining the end, but you know, if, if you know how Bart's production of My Fair Lady ended, um, that gesture uh, was completely dependent on that space. Yeah, it was. Completely. I mean, even if he had moved that to uh, a house on Broadway, you know, to the St. James Theater, you couldn't have gotten the same effect. It just wouldn't have worked as well. So, you know, I think space does have a great deal to do with what you're doing. I, you know, I, I've talked a little bit about this production I did in Tokyo of West Side, which the reason I wanted to do it was, it was literally figuring out how the, the challenges of this space. This space was like a huge donut in the middle of a big circle. And they had, there were screens, curved screens that opened and closed with multimedia video. And the audience wasn't aware that we were on a huge disc, uh, 1400 seat that was moving slowly. And the, as the screen would open, you would think, oh my God, how did they build, bring that whole new set in? And we weren't, we were, we were turning, we were evolving. It was a magic trick. And ultimately the world of New York was created in a way that it never had been in a production of West Side Story because you didn't need to remove the scenery for the dances to happen which is the big thing in musicals. If you have a big dance, you got to make sure that's, that set is cleared out of the way. 
Um, and this was a case where, uh, you know, Anna Luisos did the set and she said it was the width of 12 Broadway stages. That's how enormous the space was. Um, and so that was a perfect example of how we could never have done that production in any other space but that. Yeah, I mean, I think space is, and most things are sort of like, like you're describing an art, you know, site-specific art installation based on where it is. But over the course of any production, any mise-en-scene, any design, is going to have to have some information in it. It could be in the wallpaper. It could be in the arrangement of the furniture. It could be in what happens as it comes apart. It could be, but it has to resonate and operate that space. And we can have a whole separate webinar on how space operates and how you develop ideas about space, um, as we could on most of these topics. Um, but it is your deepest friend. It takes the longest time to have the plasticity of movement within a particular space to, to be able to figure out how to develop and think of how space can operate to serve whatever piece you're doing, to then push it, to like blow apart and do something new. These are all uh, real experiential things that come about through a lot of work in the theater. It, and it's the funnest part of it, I think. For me, it's one of the funnest parts. And you need time, you know, and that's the luxury is it often you don't get time and to have the time because many times I have found with the greatest uh, designs and the spaces that a happy accident happens during tech, you know, where something, an element is moving in or out and it, and you're just slowly doing it because you're in the middle of tech and you suddenly see something and say, wait, wait, stop, stop, put it right there, keep it there. And you say, but what are you talking about? I said, oh, I have a new idea. And uh, that's uh, such a luxury when that happens, but it is enormous fun too. Can you, uh, can I ask you to talk a little bit about that production of West Side Story you did in Tokyo? It sounded fascinating. Could you? Well, that's what the one I was just talking about with yeah. the donuts and them turning around. I mean, you talk about replacement. Um, the fascinating thing for me was uh, it was a big hit over there. And, you know, we brought all American actors and we did it and we had Japanese uh super titles like in the opera um and then after they ran for i guess six months we replaced the whole cast with an all japanese cast and the japanese actors i had an interpreter and the japanese actors um you know they work completely differently than American actors. So you talk about replacing people. We had Japanese pop stars in it who played to like Madison Square Garden playing Tony and Maria, but they'd never acted. So it, it, I had to use a whole other set of skills on that. But it was fascinating watching the Japanese and bring their culture to this material. Uh, certain things, you know, the fighting, I thought, oh, are they, because they seem like such a serene, peaceful, they were terrifying in the fighting because they brought a lot of their skills, even in, in going back to, you know, sumo wrestling and to, you know, uh, feudal wars. And I mean, they had all this training physically, but they wouldn't, they, it took me three weeks of rehearsal before I could get Tony to kiss Maria because they don't kiss in public. <laughs> so these are just cultural things you have to be aware of. How did the, it, can you describe in a more detail how those, how the audience kind of turned into the, I was trying to. It's very hard to describe until you see it in person or because when you're in it in person, you don't even realize you're moving, but you are on basically um, like a giant lazy Susan and you, the whole audience is moving, but you don't see. realize you're moving as you're moving. Uh, but it allows you to open up. The space was so enormous that I had a sent the, I put the last scene in Central Park by the Angel of Bethesda Fountain. And, and I had 120 feet deep. And the stage was 120 feet wide, that one set. So, I mean, even I know, Bart, uh, you've worked at the Met. You know, one of my first jobs in New York as a struggling actor was a tour guide at the at Lincoln Center. And so, you know, I know that the Metropolitan Opera stage is 60 feet wide, 
which is huge and huge for New York, but 120 feet, that was just unbelievable. Mark, um, when you came to talk to our undergraduates about, it was about 15 years ago, I think, um, you, you talked at one point about what you learned from um, the legendary Italian director, Giorgio Strehler, about uh, finding a moment in a play when you can get at the central idea and use the staging and use the, the space to open it up. I think you cited the Light in the Piazza number, yeah. Light in the Piazza. Could you talk a little bit about that? I found it fascinating. Yeah, I think that may have been a mixture of Strehler and Cantor, the, the Polish director I was talking about earlier. Um, uh, again, this is a little bit related to space and how space operates and metaphor. Um, there's a moment at the, in the second half of Light in the Piazza where you know, the young girl is lost and we had the whole, you know, all these towers that were you know, mimicking and, and showing us to be uh, in Italy and it had all felt very realistic up until this point and then pulled all of them away as she got to her most desperate moment in the wedding dress, thinking that her life was falling apart, racing through a, spe a space that's huge all by herself. And so you're shifting the set of rules and opening them up into a metaphor, uh, an expression of something deeper. And that came out of the study of some of those directors, of uh, directors like Strehler and, and uh, Contour to try to kind of unpack different metaphors in a piece. You, you have the same thing in, you know, even in Barber Seville, if you get to the, you know, the last act and it, it, it gets to a big denouement and we open up and use this um, passerelle that I built at the Met and change all the rules of the space right at the point that the story is sort of deepening or shifting. It's kind of a trick, it's kind of a thing, it's kind of like searching for metaphor it's cracking once an audience is bought into an experience then they're malleable to the poetics of that experience and they can open up to new ideas because they're inside the spell of a piece and once they're there you have a different responsibility about how to operate and play inside of that experience and where it can go so any piece that people really love it usually means that they gave themselves over to something which allowed them to resonate in another world in a way they didn't expect that could be you know, three seasons of The Crown that you watch, you know, in one sitting, or that could be something else that are releasing you into another world. And then it's playing with you or your imagination, your sense of history, your sense of yourself, your sense of your family, and you're lost in the, in the poetics of that world. And that's what we do with space, with design, with a great performance, with costume, you know, all of the things we're playing with how to make that kind of thing happen. How much, uh, if at all, would you say a play changes in the course of its run? Well, hopefully it deepens, but it doesn't broaden. <laughs> That's that. Yes, uh, I mean, that famous answer. line about the uh, director, you know, who will go back to check up on the play, having been away for a month or two two months and say just to take out all the improvements you know um <laughs> because there are many times where you know uh, things will be bent and stretched too far but there are also many times where as bart said it gets deeper and deeper and richer and richer yeah you want them to be you know each night is a exploration of the same ideas do you want them to be able to really deeply explore them? And there are gonna be good nights and bad nights at that. What they shouldn't be doing is broadening. They shouldn't be stepping out of the boundaries of the production itself. You know, if you're in, if you're in a, if you're in a dance number, you don't get to change you can't. the dance. You yeah. Can't yeah. So that's kind of similar when it comes to the staging of a scene, yeah. but there are ways in which even inside a dance, you're gonna be really in it and really hooking in certain days and other days you're gonna be phoning it in. So who knows, but that's the great, you know, you watch people who do a show for a whole year, two years longer, and they can keep finding that space each time they see it, no matter what kind of where their life is or what they had for dinner or how much they were fighting with their significant other, whatever, they yeah. will, they'll find that space. And that's when I love an actor like Uta Hagen used to say, you know, she was in, 
there were certain scenes in Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf she didn't really connect to until she had been in it for a year and a half, <laughs> you know. Uh, but that's, you know, that's an actor who loves their, their craft. That's why I laugh at some people who, you know, uh, come to do a play in New York and they're in it for six weeks and say, oh, I'm tired, I'm bored, yeah. I want to move on, you know. And you say, well, then you really don't, understand or maybe respect the, the, the art of acting on stage yeah. because it isn't, it isn't a movie where you're just putting it in the can and moving on. You know? As Stanislavski used to say, it would take a hundred performances before you yeah. start to really understand the role. Yeah. And, and so, and he would make them go off and work on their own and like keep practicing and then he wouldn't even give them notes for two weeks yeah. or even show up. They just had to work on their own and then he'd show up and then like reshape it once they knew it well enough. That. I also have to say something that might be obvious. I mean, it's obvious to me about Bart, but, and I feel it myself. And to anyone out there wanting to be a director, I think that one of the great things about Holy Cross and a liberal arts education, I mean, I was a double major, Greek and Latin and English lit. They didn't have a theater major when I was at Holy Cross. I did a lot of theater, but I, I wasn't my major. And all those co language courses and literature courses and art courses and music courses, those helped me so much as a director later on, because in the deep recesses of your mind, you realize, oh my God, that's like, you know, that, that's like a, a, that reminds me of a, of a painting by Watteau or that remind you know, and suddenly it just in, deepens and enriches, enriches your, your, your art, your skills. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely true. The, yeah, you don't need a theater major to be good at theater. Mm -hmm. That's, that's another conversation. That's, that's a longer <laughs> yeah. conversation. That's a whole nother thing. A, a well-developed mind, a sense of history, a sense of ideas, a connection, political point of view, uh, lived experience, uh, responses to the time, they, they matter. Uh, 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 thinking at a high level, but you're gonna follow your own impulses. The actual work of learning how to act or figuring out design, doing all that, that won't, that, that, that's, you can learn on your own if your mind is strong or your heart. Yeah, both, I think. Yeah. You know, your passion. Gentlemen, thank you very much. This was a wonderful conversation. Um, and I learned a great deal. I'm sure our attendees did as well. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I look Absolutely. forward to seeing your productions when we return to live theater, which we are all champing of the bit to do. And um, good luck. Thank you. And I would also say that, that you know, the, the, this new performing arts center that's coming to Holy Cross that Father Burroughs has pushed along very uh, profoundly is an extraordinary place. And I think it will be very, very special for the school. I mean, I, I loved Fenwick Theater. I hope they keep it. <laughs> I, I hope they there. keep it, yeah. yeah but it was limited. Beautiful space, yeah. but this idea of at the center of the school is a place where people can practice these ideas and leave their majors and come in and make work or make music or make art is really central to a really healthy and strong liberal arts institution. And the idea that this place is soon coming on, uh, is will soon be finished and built is very, very important to the school. and and you know, is really a great thing. So I'm very proud of Holy Cross that they were able to pull that off. And I think it's, I think it's a very extraordinary thing. And, and you know, I think there will be some great work to be made there. We're very excited. Yeah. Thank you again and Thanks. good night. Thanks, David. Good night. Good night. Good night. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, stay safe. Stay safe. Okay.